This is the question that first sparked the journey uh, that I took to um, complete the novel. What is this question? Why, why was a young, unknown Scottish writer in poor health hiking this remote road above Carmel Valley, California in 1879? And this was a hike that almost killed Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Kidnap Treasure Island, Jekyll and Hyde, and many others. And this is a modern picture of that road, Robinson Canyon Road above Mid Valley. It's uh, full of live oak, chaparral, and in 1879, it looked pretty much the same, I believe, from old photos. Um, what was Stevenson, 26 years old, doing there 5,000 miles from his Edinburgh home? His parents were quite wealthy. Well, this person had something to do with why he was there, and she graces the cover of the book. Her name was Fanny Osborne. She was a San Franciscan at the time they met. She was about 35 in this picture, and she was studying art in France when just happened to be canoeing by was Robert Louis Stevenson, who was about 11 years younger than her. She was very unhappily married to an upstanding San Francisco citizen named Sam Osborne. And uh, Sam was a very handsome guy, but uh, somewhat of a philanderer. Uh, don't have time to go into that. <laughs> At any rate, she got her children. She was a tough lady. She got her children on a steamer in a roundabout way, got herself to France in the mid-1870s to study art with the early Impressionists. Um, Stevenson described her look, that she was about five feet tall. When she looked at you, he said it was like someone sighting down a pistol. <laughs> she was a tough, tough woman. And this was uh, Stevenson, and that's an actual sketch that Fanny made of him. This one thing I like, and I wanted to use this especially in talking about writing historical fiction. I love images. Fanny did that sketch shortly after she met Stevenson, and I think it's a very affectionate sketch. Um, here's the real guy. You know, and it's, I mean, it's, it's close. Uh, that's a photo. But um, he was, uh, again, young. And so I turned this into the first scene of my book. The two of them had met, fallen in love. She was still married, had a husband in San Francisco, all kinds of complications why this shouldn't work. Okay, but um, nonetheless, she decided to go back after falling in love with Stevenson to her family and try to make a go of it, um, partly for economic pressures and because of the kids. Okay, so I imagine that she did this sketch on the day that she was going to tell him she had to go home. And this one minute reading here goes like this. They walked out into the forest in the Fontainebleau and she set down her easel. She formed a rectangle with her fingers and considered Lewis through this frame, trying not to be distracted by the meadow behind them. His face was oblong, like a long stone hanging from an earring, slight, trifling almost, but with unusual length from the eyebrows down to the chin, long, thin nose, and beneath it the wry grin that would be charming, except the teeth were stained and a little bit crooked. She would draw him with eye, lips closed. A gentle mouth, a boy's really, except for the thin mustache above it. The nose, a classic shape, slender like the rest of him, and the eyes, sensuous and unlike her husband's, utterly without guile. Are you certain that you are all right, Fanny? Lewis asked. You look so sad, she swallowed. Don't talk, it distracts me. She took up a pencil and quickly sketched his face and its features in rough proportion to what she observed. Then she worked on the rest of him. The big coat with its wide lapels that dwarfed his shoulders pleased her. She added shading to suggest bulk until satisfied that her drawing captured the way he looked like a boy who had put on his father's coat. The humor provided by the coat might counterbalance the haunting strangeness of the thin face. Now to the hands. He had propped one of them on a knee so that the fingers dangled downward. Long, lean, and delicate, they were the fingers of a pianist or perhaps a masseur. Sinful fingers. He smiled playfully. I saw that look, Fanny Osborne. What look? Just for an instant, the grim look you've had all day gave way to a naughty grin. Nonsense. 
She dug in her purse for a cigarette, paper, and tobacco. Lewis relaxed from his pose, and they each rolled a cigarette. Fanny realized that her hands were trembling, so she held them to her sides while Lewis struck a match. She wondered if the children were busy packing for the long trip home, as she had asked. Tell him now. Lewis blew smoke to the wind and smiled. What are you thinking, Fanny? She swallowed. I'm thinking we should finish the sketch. <laughs> so shortly after this sketch, then, in, in my fictionalized version of history, she tells him. And she takes the children, gets on a boat, and goes back to California. Lewis spent a miserable year um, living with the parents, like a lot of 20-somethings do, in Edinburgh. Uh, and just scheming about how he was going to get to California and rekindle things with Fanny. Um, to do, write the book, I did some research, uh, a lot of research actually. Uh, luckily, a lot of the sources are near us. This was the Stevenson Museum uh, in St. Helena where, you know, you can get vetted and as a scholar you can put on little white gloves and, and be allowed in to see Fanny's scrapbook is there, her photographs, her letters. You can look at her handwriting, her stationery she used. I got a lot of insights into her character and also her kids and Lewis that way. Also, um, Lewis published, or Yale has published eight volumes of Lewis's letters. He was a beautiful letter writer and slapdash handwriting. You can hardly understand his. Hers is very neat. Um, he also drew and doodled cartoons all over his letters, which I thought was really neat. And that's my writing process. <laughs> um, okay, so this uh, journey took me to the Stevenson's home in Edinburgh, um, 17 Harriet Row. It's still a very um, smart neighborhood. This was a view out of his parents' bedroom. So I have a scene that I wrote in his father's bedroom where very formally the father said, what's the matter with you? And he confesses that he's fallen in love and he tells her it's with Mrs. Osborne and she lives in California. And, uh, and so the father was adamantly opposed, obviously, you know, and, uh, but so Lewis had to sneak off when he made his escape and, and spent a year in California. Um, and this is what he came to Downtown Monterey looked like this. It's quite a switch from Edinburgh <laughs> um, in the 1870s. It got a lot of great old photos at the um, California State Library in Sacramento. And this is the um, cottage that uh, he rented a room up on the upper right, and this is about the way it looked like then. Now it's beautiful with bougainvilleas and all kinds of things growing in the garden and the state. Parks runs, the, uh, runs tours through there. Um, he camped out in Monterey, and I'll just complete the story right now because uh, I'm, I'm going to run out of time in a minute, but he stayed in that little uh, unheated room for about three months, and he almost immediately went tapped on Fanny's door and proposed marriage. <laughs> and he looked like heck. He had been on a steamer and then the Transcontinental Railroad and then a narrow gauge railroad and a wagon to get to her. And he was very sick, had sores on his face, dirt on his clothes, and will you marry me? And she said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> so um, she said, actually, she said something like, um, Lewis, you know, you got to give me some time. This is kind of a big one because yeah, he just showed up, right? And, uh, and so he said, as long as it takes you, and he stayed nearby. He went to the Bohemia Saloon in Monterey, which is a place where he told stories for a Nicola story in order to support himself. And then she moved back from Monterey, where she had, was with the kids again, um, to San Francisco. This was the ferry building at around that time, just a beehive. I mean, you couldn't drive over a bridge to get to San Francisco then. So it was busier than it, than it is now. And those are omnibuses, uh, horse-powered. I don't believe they're steam or cable-powered, but um, that's what it would have looked like. So several uh, scenes are set there. Bush Street, uh, where he spent the winter in a little tiny uh, apartment. This is a, you know, the plaque on the current door, but the original house came down with the 06 earthquake. That's 1906. 
Um, not to be a story wrecker, but the couple eventually, about a year later, honeymooned near an abandoned mine in uh, <laughs> Calistoga. How romantic. Yeah, in a miner's cabin. And that uh, little hole up there on the hill is the mine shaft where Lewis took it over and made it into his wine cellar. And the two of them, uh, the cabin was right about there, very remote and rugged, but, but they were happy. Then he took his blended family home to meet the parents. Mm -hmm. And this is Braemar, Scotland in the Highlands where my wife, Esta, and I spent a week at the cottage where to enter, entertain his stepson, he started telling a continued story over tea. And that story was about a, a wooden-legged pirate, Long John Silver, and, and he just spooled this stuff out at night. It came very easily to him. He had been an essayist before then. But to tell this 11-year-old boy a story was the easiest writing he did. And that became, of course, Treasure Island, huge classic. This was the home in which he worked. This was a window to the room in which he sat. It was off limits to where we were staying uh, downstairs because the owner lives in there. So he rented it out. He's an Aberdeen oil man now. Treasure map. Um, this is actually my process. This is a. Um, plotting board for my new novel about Jack London. The top blue line is, is Jack's um, timeline, and the bottom one, coded in red, is his second wife, Charmian. So there's some really great parallels to this story, but in this case, Jack was very unhappily married and had to find a way out of that um, situation to marry the person he should have married in the first place, whose name was Charmian. And uh, so anyway, I worked on this in Vermont and, and uh, plotted it all out, and I'm slogging away, and I've gotten through a first draft. My time is up. This is an iconic picture of Jack um, in his favorite writing studio in, in Glen Ellen, <laughs> um, under the trees on a boulder. And he is, this is about the time he wrote Call of the Wild, very hunky-looking um, guy, fascinating person, very different than Stevenson, of course. And this was Charmian and Jack. Now they were, they're rich and famous, living their dream and yachting around the world, stopping in Waikiki, and that's the way, the way they looked in about 1907. And that's all my time. I've got some questions to pose, but uh, oh, my website, if you want to see it, that is a John Singer Sargent. Mary knows something about him, <laughs> a portrait of Stevenson, very famous portrait. So um, thank you for listening, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker.